Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock. Thank you for joining me on this marvelous day after Tuesday, uh, hump day, day before Thursday. It's Wednesday. Uh, and Uncle Jimmy still doing well, uh, still not back with us, uh, but he is doing better and his recovery is going well. Appreciate your thoughts and prayers. Uh, the show continues on. The show goes on. The train keeps moving. My football coach in college, he always talked about that. It's like, train is leaving the station with or without you. Uh, you'll have to play catch up. And so uh, this fearless train is moving on. And I feel like uh, we're about to have a very, very special show. Uh, I hope, or at least the way I envisioned it, this morning and I was going over it in my mind. You know, yesterday we had uh, Shamika Michelle on and, and she told a very uh, shocking story and I promised you guys that we would follow up uh, on that at some point today and we will, but not in full detail because something else is on my heart and mind uh, this morning. Shamika will be on the show, we'll get her reaction uh, to my mono, my fire starter here, and we'll talk a little bit about her uh, radical transparency yesterday about her as an 18-year-old child in college and pulling a gun on another young lady and firing that gun at another young lady. And I, I was caught off guard and we're, we're gonna get, before the week is out, we're gonna get the full Shamika story and have a conversation about it, but something else is, is on my mind, and today is Wednesday, it's Tennessee Harmony Day. Uh, Pastor Bobby Harrington's already here in studio. Uh, he and uh, Pastor Anthony Walker will join me in about an hour, uh, maybe longer. We'll see how long uh, I go with this fire starter. Pastor Harrington's here in studio with me right now, and, and I hope he's prepared, and I hope I'm prepared uh, for what I'm about to deliver in terms of this fire start, I hope I show some discipline because uh, we were debating before I started the show, like should, should Bobby be in studio, out of studio? Should he be behind the glass? You guys know that I struggle with my discipline, with my language uh, from time to time. And I, maybe Bobby's here because God asked him to be here to make sure that I don't dirty up what I'm about to say by using any foul language. And so Bobby's here as a reminder to me, thank you for being here, Bobby, to, to make sure that I, I articulate what I'm about to articulate without using foul language, because I want this, what I'm about to say, to edify everybody, and I want everybody to feel comfortable accessing it. And, and you guys know I've been on a uh, kick about fearless men and about an energy uh, that we have to tap into as men if we're going to right the American ship, if we're going to push back against a culture that in my view has turned completely satanic. And I don't think I'm alone in thinking that. Uh, I run into a lot of people that are like, wow, what is going on here in America uh, we've turned the lie into a truth and the truth into a lie. And anytime, we were talking about it yesterday with Delano, anytime uh, there's an assault on truth, that's an assault on God. And, and it's, it's funny that, that Bobby showed up early today because Bobby probably put this on my mind inadvertently. Uh, this weekend he sent me uh, another sermon from Tony Evans very well known uh, minister for a long, 23rd, my, my grandmother loved Tony Evans. He's been doing it for a long time. He's one of the best in the business. And Bobby sent me a, uh, <clears throat> a two year old sermon, maybe three years old, uh, uh, Adam, where are you at? Or men, where are you? And it, it, it coincides with this overall message that I've been leaning into. And it coincides with the message and the conversation I've been having about ESPN the Emasculated Sports Personalities Network. I started talking about that last week, and I've been mocking and calling out 
uh, people, Randy Moss and his tears for jeers, all that fake crying. I'm saying it's got to stop. And it's like the ESPN people don't understand, the ESPN personalities don't understand the role they're playing in the emasculation of American men and really the destruction of this country. Once you emasculate the man, the family, the neighborhoods, the communities, the cities, the states, the countries, all become emasculated. And the, the, that's why, and again, Tony, Tony Evans preaching from Genesis, uh, I believe chapter three, verses eight through 12, you know, and God calling out, where are you at, man? This is on you. And I've been feeling that energy for a long time, but it's become really acute here in the past week. And that's what, when, when I saw Randy Moss crying on TV about an email, it kind of set me off and made me start talking about ESPN as a whole in a way that I, I, I've never really done. And, and you know, I, I started, uh, I think last week at some point, I made some comments about First Take and Molly Karam and the role that uh, women play at ESPN and, and how they're part of the emasculation process. And, and so I want to start with this foundation of here's what I said last week about ESPN, something that transpired on first take. I mocked Marley Karam a bit and just, but, but it wasn't really a personal attack. It was more about the role that women play at ESPN and how they've added this estrogen and feminine energy to all conversations at ESPN. So I just wanna, let's remind everybody, let's start with this foundation. Here's what I said and did last week. I'm sorry, has the vaccine killed somebody that I didn't? I mean, has that been the reason people died? Well, if we go down that road, there's, we go down that road, I mean, Moderna's just okay. stopped in Sweden so, okay. and different so, things. All right, all right, let's be careful. Let's not I, get I, into I, the medical saying, science, guys. We, you, see, you, you see what happened. Once the conversation got real, uh, uh, guys, hey, hey, guys, uh, uh, let's be careful. Uh, 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 let, commercial, commercial break. Okay, Jay, that's Molly Karam's job. Molly Karam or Sam Ponder or whoever they got sitting there, there, they're, they're little, on the little puppet string. Hey, guys, guys cut it out! Oh, that's getting too real up in here. Let's go to commercial. Let's go to commercial. Look at my breast. I look great, don't I, guys? Don't look. Look at TNA. I'm here. I don't know a damn thing about the NBA, but <laughs> look at my legs. Y'all can hate me if you want, but that's not Cassidy Hubbard talking. That's a supermodel that's there to chant and scream whatever the producers in her ear tell her. And they told her, stop it before one of these Negroes says something that pisses off one of our sponsors or goes against what we want done. And that, that's the job, they're overseers. Big, attractive overseers that are there to make sure that the Negroes don't say anything that's not on script. Get us to commercial break, Molly. Anyway, I don't know if you can be more fearless than I just was there, but uh, have at it, Steve. <laughs> yeah, a couple things. I will be checking Jalen Rose's Twitter feed in several hours to see if he wants to go on site with you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, ugh, God. I mean, geez. Let now, me tell Jalen's been dealing with my smoke since he was 19 years old. He, <laughs> he knows I could care less, but go ahead. All right, so that's what I said uh, last week. And, and Steve Kim reacted to what I said with a little throwaway line, funny line about Jalen Rose, connecting it to Randy Moss. And, and you know, I'm glad that I just had my memory refreshed about what I did and, and what I said. And, and I said some things in a very brutal fashion, uh, comedic fashion. Uh, the facts of what I'm saying is true. I, 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 I can see why perhaps Jalen Rose interpreted that as a personal shot 
at his wife, Molly Karam. He's married to Molly Karam. And, and I called her supermodel and, and said, basically, I'm gonna clean it up from what I said last week, but they put all these supermodels on ESPN. You have to be very attractive to have one of these roles at ESPN or Fox Sports. I don't wanna leave any of these, Fox News, I don't wanna leave any of them out. For the most part, in order to get one of these hostess jobs or whatever, you better look damn good. You better be in between a nine or a 10 on a scale of one to 10. And what you know about sports is irrelevant. You just need to look good. You need to be there as eye candy. And then you need to be there as an overseer to make sure that you shout and scream whenever one of these broadcasters, whether black or white, uh, goes outside the little white lines they've set up for these guys to stay between. And, and what my overall point is, is that we all know in the real world, when men talk sports, when boys talk sports, when athletes talk sports, they normally talk amongst themselves. There isn't a supermodel sitting in your home, generally, unless you're lucky, and maybe, maybe some of you are married to IG models or supermodels or, or whatever, but for the most part, when you're at the sports bar with your boys, your friends, there's not some piece of eye candy sitting there waiting to shout and scream if you go too far. The conversation goes wherever it goes, and amongst men, there's a conversation, amongst athletes, people talking sports, and yes, are there some women? And again, I reference Cassidy Hubbard. Uh, I, I, I will reference some of the, the, like the real, Sally Jenkins, a real journalist, a real sports journalist, 40 years in the business as a journalist. Christine Brennan, I don't even agree with most of the stuff Christine Brennan says, but has she earned her chops as a journalist? attended sports throughout her career, covered them in a real way, and had earned a seat at the table? Did I go on the sports reporters back in the day with any and all of these women? Absolutely. They had to earn their way to engage in that conversation. They weren't there because they looked like supermodels. I have no problem, Cassidy Hubbard, Ramona Shelbourne, H H Linda Cohn, who's earned her, Hannah Storm in any of, but we know we've moved into this modern era where your looks get you a seat at the table and these guys don't understand why these women have been dropped into the middle of these conversations. They're there to feminize the entire conversation. They're there to compromise the entire conversation. They're there to make sure that no one just follows the truth wherever it leads. And I know we live in this make-believe world now where there is no difference between man and woman. I know we live in this make-believe world where uh, I played college football and I'm supposed to sit down with minor Kimes or whatever woman they put in front of me or somebody else, and I'm supposed to pretend like, oh, yeah, Minor Kimes knows as much as I do about football. I don't live in that make-believe world. I'm not going to live in that make-believe world. I feel sorry for everybody that has to live in that make-believe world. And so, I'm trying to make an overall point about men and what we've done to the conversation. And so I'm going to give you an example of what has been done to men. I just made a little passing comment, playful comment about Jalen Rose, and he's been dealing with my smoke since he was 19 years old. I'm going to now show you what has happened to men, because Jalen Rose is a man. But I wanna show you what this new environment has done to men. Here's Jalen Rose on his personal IG Live, I believe, reacting to my passing comment. But I, but I hear somebody out there bragging about 
giving me smoke and trolling me since I was 19 years of age. I got a newsflash. I ain't 19 no more. Keep playing with my name if you want to. You know who I'm talking to. And I don't bark, I don't pump fake. Keep playing with my name. And try to use my name to launch every new show you, you do because you've been a part of so many failing shows. And I see a couple of people guessing. It definitely ain't Stephen A. That's my brother. I love him. Good we about rise. to be crushing it on Countdown this year. It definitely ain't Kendrick Perkins. That's my brother. We about to crush it on NBA today. Support them today. Him and Richard and Malika start today. Sure. They don't work at ESPN. Who I'm talking about don't work at ESPN. They don't work at Fox. I don't know where they work. But like I said, you get jammed up. Don't mention my name. That part. Now, most people right now are going to the bathroom and not show y'all pregame getting ready. It definitely ain't Marbury. That's my brother. I got to also say this. Not getting the validation is not an act of being socially conscious. It's just a personal okay. choice. It's not Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. It's not Muhammad Ali. It just means that you decided not to get vaccinated. That's it. So... That's Jalen Rose talking about me. And, and this is my problem, and I, I want to speak directly to Jalen Rose. Jalen Rose, say whatever you want to say with your chest out like a real man. Don't dance around. You're talking about me. You know my name. You've known my name since you was 19 years old. Say it. This is what I'm talking about, this feminine energy that's just running wild with men. You can't even say my name. Stick your chest out and say my name. And I'm not saying this as two kids on a playground talking about fighting. I'm 54 years old, I'm fat, I don't want to fight nobody. Them days are long gone for me. I'm a grown man. You purport to be a grown man. We should be able to agree, disagree, criti be critical of each other without, uh, what was, I thought I wrote it down. You get jammed up, don't say my name. This uh, don't play with my name. Jay, handle it however you want. I, I get you're from Detroit. I get you got a do rag on with an afro, pretending to be hood. And see, what I'm talking about is a level of authenticity among men. What Delano and I were talking about yesterday is any time there's an absence of truth, there's an absence of God. Any time there's an absence of truth, you're talking about satanic energy. And so Jalen, when you start to, I don't even know where he's at. If you don't know where I'm at, how do you know what I said? Authenticity. You're not the little kid from the hood in Detroit anymore. Take the do rag off. Take all the tough guy talk off the table. 
Grow up and be a man. If there's some problem with me or anybody else, say their name. Move away from the lot. I never said nothing about trolling you. I said nothing about giving you smoke. I said he's been dealing with my smoke since he was 19 years old. And you know exactly what I mean. That wasn't about giving you smoke. That was about me saying, man, I've been saying and writing whatever I think and putting my name on it for since Jalen Rose was 19 and we were both in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I was saying things then that Steve Fisher didn't like, the head basketball coach at the University of Michigan, that the Fab Five, you and ever didn't like since you were 19 years old. I've never hid. I put my name on anything that I've said. I've people that I've wanted to call out, I've called them out by name and showed up. If people have a problem with me, have at it. Because that's what men do. What was the other? Use, use my name for failing shows. This is what I'm talking about, authenticity. And when there's an absence of truth, there's the presence of Satan. Jalen, I'm not using your name. I was talking about Molly and the feminine energy that's running wild at ESPN. I wasn't using your name. Steve Kim brought it up. That, that comment in passing about you has nothing to do with the, the success, failure, popularity of this show. I've had no failing shows, Jalen, and you know that. When there's an absence of truth, there's a satanic energy at play. An assault on the truth is an assault on God. I think those are all the notes I have written down as it relates to Jalen and the dishonesty that he was displaying there. And so I, I, I want to one more time speak directly to Jalen Rose and, and I want to clear the air and clarify my position on Jalen Rose. Jalen Rose, I believe, is a well-intentioned person. I believe fame and money and uh, ESPN have led him astray. Again, I have been following Jalen Rose's career as an athlete and, a as a, and as a broadcaster since he was 19 years old. He's well-intentioned, but he's also delusional, like a lot of people in the media are. This social media thing is a drug, the worst drug ever invented. It deludes people. It makes people with afros put on do-rags for videos because they want to show, look how ghetto and street I am. And Jalen, I get that our issues or your issues with me go a bit deeper because I have called you and other athletes out who sit on TV, demonize every white person that they can, act like Colin Kaepernick is the second coming of Muhammad Ali, uh, play the race card constantly. And I've called it out in a very truthful and authentic way because a lot of guys that make the marriage decision that Jalen did marrying a non-black woman. They then go on TV and on public spaces and pretend to be Malcolm X, except they married Becky Shabazz, not Betty. It's a cover, it's inauthentic. I don't have a problem with it. Anybody that knows me 
knows I've dated plenty of white women. I don't have a problem with interracial relationships at all. I have a problem with the inauthentic, the, the inauthentic reaction that I keep seeing from people who make this decision and then they go play like they're the blackest Louis Farrakhan cast off on the planet and you're not. Cut it out. You cannot love the fruit and hate the tree. It's impossible. I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm not trying to challenge you in some kind of physical. I'm not trying to punk you out. I'm trying to shake you and wake you up. Keep it real. We are living in a time where it is necessary for men to keep it real. Y'all think you think I'm playing with your name. You're playing with God. All of you that are insisting on these lies and building a world built on lies where you are dishonest with people and refuse to tell them the truth. You're playing with God. All of this dishonesty that we've legalized, all of these lies that we tell every day, that's an assault on God. I, I don't know where Jalen stands uh, faith-wise. I have no idea. I, I will say that I, people will hear this and Jalen Rose thinks I've got some personal problem. with. I don't. When Jalen Rose started the Jalen Rose Academy, I was one of the first people to donate money to it. I like many and some of the things that Jalen Rose is about and does. But we are not at a time right now where I'm going to sit silent as people play with the truth and particularly play with the truth along racial lines. We are at the brink of a civil war and major racial conflict in this country. And if men don't stand up, this thing is going to end badly for all of us. And I can tell you who's gonna, it's gonna end badly for first and the worst. People that look like me and Jalen Rose. Jalen Rose sitting on $100 million or however much he made from the NBA and all the money he's made from ESPN, maybe he feels like he's good. But these games we keep playing along racial lines, it's going to end very poorly for the great mass of black people. And I know it's, like, it's great to build a following and look at all the retweets and likes I got. Look at all the, and we're gonna get into it with the ministers uh, on the back half of this show about Tennessee Harmony. I'm looking at churches play the race card to draw a following. We as men need to start playing the truth card and draw a following with the truth. If you draw on a following with lies, you're doing the work of the devil. And I'm, I, I don't know if it's coming across in my tone. My, my tone may be wrong, but I, I really don't want some kind of battle, war, war of words with Jalen Rose. I'm coming at him as a grown man and say, hey man, cut it out. Let's really keep it real. Let's do what's best for the great mass of people in America, regardless of color. And those of you that, that have these platforms at ESPN, and sit there and, and lead other athletes astray, cut it out. I'm, I'm trying to, and you know what, I want to reference uh, Tony Evans because 
again, as I said at the beginning of this, his, the sermon that Pastor Bobby sent me uh, is why it's a reflection of the spirit that I'm in right now. I, I'm, I'm trying to reach out to men and say, it's our time to be fearless and bold. And we have to go look at this feminine energy that they're injecting into America, in every aspect of America, the church, uh, the, the, the sports world, ESPN, it's the worldwide leader. It's leading the sports discussion. Sports has been a great source of masculine energy. They've turned this whole conversation around in the last 10 to 20 years into that sports and football in particular. Oh, it's a source of toxic masculinity. It's a negative in the culture. And they've done this by, part of what they've done is by placing women on all of these platforms and making all of these men fold. Oh, there's a woman on the panel. Now I can't say what I really think. She'll, I'll get accused of being sexist if I say what I really think. Everybody living in fear. Well, as men, we have to move past that. And we have to move in a fearless, bold way. Or this country is going to go away. And it's going to be overtaken by the Marxists and the atheists and the satanic people that are winning a culture war right now because men won't stand up and be men. No safe space for real men. We all got to act feminine and say a bunch of stuff we don't believe. We have, oh my God, men can get pregnant. And I got to sit around and act like there's some truth in that. And our women are out of control. And Jalen, I, I get it. You had a great mother. I've heard you talk about her. Sounds very similar to my own mother. I had a great one. And I get it. We talk about black mothers have been celebrated and put on a pedestal and they're at the top of the matriarchy. And when you have a great mother like that, and particularly in the black, a black one, and in this culture, it's real hard not to see them as leaders. But if you're spiritually grounded, if you're based in a biblical worldview, you'll tell your mother and any other woman, stand back, I'm running this. I've had to tell my mother, and I had a great one, but she ain't running nothing. And it hurt, it probably irritates her that I talk about it like the way that I do. But she don't trump God. There's a responsibility and a role that we have to play as men. And it's great that we had great mothers that did unbelievable things for us and sacrificed for us. But I'm not sacrificing my manhood and the responsibilities placed on me by God because of what my mother did for me as a child. This is what, this feminine energy. And I get that I was lucky and blessed that my father was in my life, my entire life, despite my parents' divorce. But I look out and see a lot of these guys on TV and I'm just, whoo, where's daddy? Tony Evans at where's man? That's what he's talking about. What seeds were planted in us as black men? And for those of you that didn't have those seeds, I'm telling you, you better get into a Bible and get a church home, get a biblical worldview and plant them seeds yourself. Because no offense to your mama, she wasn't able to do it. And that's why you running around thinking Stacey Abrams is going to lead us to the promised land. Stacey Abrams is going to lead you to Chick-fil-A and that's about it. And yes, I'm overweight. But you're not going to see me running behind no woman 
thinking she's taking me to the promised land. God's already told me it's my responsibility. So all to fall back and follow behind me. Take on that responsibility as men. It's time to be fearless. I want to tell you uh, about my friends at Good Ranchers. I'm, I'm just going to keep it all the way real. Uh, the reason to support these guys at Good Ranchers is because they support me and they support a fearless worldview. They support men doing what, handling the responsibilities placed on us by a higher power. They support America, farm raised, uh, American farmers, 100% American farm raised, uh, grass fed beef, grain finished. It's the best, but more <laughs> important than that, Good Ranchers is fearless and bold and loves America and loves what we do here. They support your worldview. That's why you need to go to GoodRanchers.com slash fearless and support them. If you want to be a part of this fearless army, if you want to stand up like a man or stand up like a woman in support of men doing their jobs, GoodRanchers.com slash fearless. You got to eat. You might as well, while you're eating, do something that supports you and this country and men standing up and being responsible and taking on the leadership role that was given to us by a higher power. GoodRanchers.com slash fearless. Don't go anywhere. I'm not done yet. I want to get into, because it plays into the same theme. I want to get into uh, last night, <clears throat> the NBA kicked off, and uh, Kyrie Irving was a topic of conversation. Charles Barkley, good friend of mine, loved Charles Barkley, said some things that I disagree with. Uh, Kenny Smith, Shaquille O'Neal participating in the conversation as well. Of course, you guys know Kyrie Irving's unvaccinated and most of the mainstream media is, you know, raining down on him for being unvaccinated and he's not playing for the Brooklyn Nets right now. It's going to cost him a bunch of money and uh, everybody's beating up on Kyrie Irving. I respect what he's doing, but let's take a listen to the NBA TNT crew and the conversation they had last night about Kyrie Irving. I would say I have empathy for what Kyrie is. Like, I can understand that he has an uncomfortability about vaccinations. I'm not going to sit here and think that I'm, because I'm vaccinated and wanted to believe in vaccinations, that I'm smarter because I probably, most people who got vaccinated probably don't know the four ingredients inside of it, that inside of vaccination. But the same way the people who are unvaccinated probably couldn't tell you the four ingredients in an aspirin. So it really comes down to comfortability. Like, what you've read and what you've understand, are you comfortable with it? Do I have sympathy? No. Uh, do I have empathy? Yes. Do I understand that he could be uncomfortable with getting vaccinated? Sure. And as long as he's willing to take the consequences for it, I cannot stop him. Now, if he says, oh, I shouldn't do this, and he's taking the consequences for it, I can understand it. That's your choice. <sighs> Maybe I wouldn't do that, but that's up to you. Your buddy over here is grimacing. Chuck? First of all, you don't get the vaccine for yourself. You get it for other people. No, I'm not saying. Hold on, saying. For a second. I want you said your piece. No, I'm saying, I, I didn't listen, say you do. I I got vaccinated. I can't wait to get the booster. I don't. You don't get vaccinated just for yourself. Like Adam said, you get vaccinated for your family first. You get vaccinated for your teammates second. Things like that. That's what bothers me about this whole thing. I think everybody should get vaccinated. The only and let me tell you something. I really am proud of the Nets for putting their foot down. Uh, for saying, no, we're not going to deal with this half on, uh, half on, half off. The only thing that bugged me, he's still going to make $17 million sitting at home. I wish they could find a way. If he wants to go on this thing, like, you know, people say he's like Ali. First of all, don't ever compare anybody to Ali. Ali went three years without boxing. He was the highest paid athlete in the world. This guy going to make $17 million for sitting at home. But to every person out there, you don't get vaccinated just for yourself. 
Let's don't, get that out the way. And, and, and no, let no one said you don't. Yeah, let Shaq have his say. We got about a minute left. I try not to tell a person what they should and shouldn't do, right? To each his own. However, in this land that we live in, there's laws and society. And then, Kenny, you know this is what I'm about to say. In order to win the championship, you got to sacrifice. So if I have the thoughts that I have and then you as a Kevin Durant, you say, I'm going to get it. And then you as James Harden say, I'm going to get it. I might as well get it. But Chuck makes a great point. It ain't about you. It's about getting everybody else. I mean, because I had some, you know, second thoughts. But, you know, I said, you know what? I'm not going to get Dr. Lucille O'Neill sick. I'm not going to get Latifah. I'm not going to get And, and I said sick. the same. No, I want to say one thing. I said Give a same, shout out to it, one of my ex-teammates who was in the ICU for the last month with COVID. Said Sabalos, I'm glad you're on the men. I love you. I'm glad you you beat this thing, brother. So I respect TNT uh, for having that conversation and allowing Kenny Smith to say what he said. Um, I, 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 I respect what Shaq said and, and I appreciate uh, what Charles said. They, they had somewhat of a full discussion about it. But to sit here and to allege that what Kyrie's doing is not shades of what Ali did. Now, I don't expect Kyrie to sit out three years. I don't expect him to sit out three months. But he has forced us to have a conversation. If without Kyrie, if everybody just hopped on board with the obedience, like everybody's doing, and who has no understanding of America and liberty and what tyranny looks like, everybody that's collecting mammoth paychecks from television networks in bed with the NBA and the NBA's in bed with Nike and Nike's in bed with China. And everybody's in bed together, all basically saying the same thing. Get the vaccine. And everybody keeps coming up with different reasons. Now it ain't about your own personal safety. You get the vaccine for everybody else. I've been crystal clear on this. The vaccine is for 50-year-old fat people like me and Charles Barkley. If a 29-year-old man in the prime of his life and in prime health who looks at the data, who looks at everything that says COVID, there's just no way it's going to harm Kyrie Irving based on the, the stats and the data. He's not Cedric Sabalos. I know Cedric Sabalos. I'm not close to him like Chuck, but Cedric got to be damn near 50. He's out of shape. And, and yes, he got COVID. We, we went through it with Uncle Jimmy. But that don't mean that Corey, at 32 years old and 170 pounds, should get the, the, the vaccine. There's just no proof it's going to harm Corey. Corey has no kids. Him and his, it, it, the, and again, this is why I really hats off to Kenny for, you know, saying like, there's reasons for people to be vaccine hesitant. And concerned like, hey, reproductive issues and all that. And again, I know they say it's very safe, but these vaccines go through years of trials normally. And if some young people are like, hey man, my own immune system, the way I take care of myself, the way I concern myself with everything I put into my body, I don't want to take the vaccine. And, and for Chuck, and man, I love Chuck. I just want to be clear, I, I, I love Chuck. But D Chuck to be sitting on TV talking about, I wish they could take 17 more million dollars away from Kyrie, cut it out, man. Because this man don't believe what you believe. Now, you want him, because you took the vaccine, now he's got to take it to protect you. Cut it out. We just went through a whole NBA season, a whole NFL season last year, 
everybody, we got full stadiums. Football, everybody, and don't nobody know who's vaccinated, who's not. None of this makes sense. And so Kyrie Irving stands up as a real man and takes a stance and forces a conversation. All we heard about from about Colin Kaepernick uh, when this first kicked off with him in 2016, well, you may not like it, but at least he started a conversation. Well, now Kyrie started one, provoked one, demanded that we have a debate about something they're trying to mandate for everybody in America. This is important. This is what men do. And again, I expect Kyrie to fold. There's too much money. There's too much pressure. I expect, but I'm still going to stand by the fact I like and respect what the man is doing. He's showing a pair. And he's being a voice for the voiceless. There are people out here that don't want to take the vaccine and no one's willing to really stand up for them other than Kyrie, as far as I can see. Without Kyrie, the NBA, and again, this whole little obedience thing, the establishment, the government tells you is in total control of your actions and protecting that paycheck from TNT is in total control of your actions. Don't, I don't, and again, this is why I go back to authenticity and truth being under attack. I don't really believe anybody on that panel, including Ernie Johnson, I don't believe any of them believe the vaccine should be mandated. They may believe in the vaccine, but do they believe it should be forced on everyone? And so I want to play this old clip. Many people have seen it, but I just want to play it just to refresh your memory. And this is what I'm talking about, because this all fits together in terms of these celebrities and influencers that, that know exactly what everybody should do. We're talking about a vaccine. We're talking about medical treatments. And I have basketball players that know exactly what Kyrie Irving should do, what Corey Smith should do, what people in Maine and people in uh, California and people in New Mexico, a basketball player knows exactly what they should all do. A basketball player. We're not talking about Dr. Fauci, a basketball player. And Chuck, I love you, but you're a basketball player and you're demanding are pressuring uh, people to get a vaccine. You're a basketball player. Recommend gym shoes, jock straps, not vaccines, unqualified. But Malcolm X told us about celebrities a long time ago. Play the clip. I just told you a little while ago, these leaders that they call leaders, this included Lena Horne, this included Dick Gregory, and this included comedians, comics, trumpet players, baseball players. Show me in the white community where a comedian is a white leader. Show me in the white community where a singer is a white leader, or a dancer or a trumpet player is a white leader. These aren't leaders. These are puppets and clowns that uh, have been set up over the white community and uh, over the black community by the white community and have been made celebrities. Man said it 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Nothing's changed, except now it's all on steroids because it's all on social media and everybody's an influencer and, and every TV show now has some former athlete, some movie star, some whatever. They're all experts on medicine now. And they're all properly using their platforms to make sure everybody does exactly what the government tells them to do. And, and here's why we know it's inauthentic. Steve Kim said it yesterday, I believe. Yeah, it was yesterday that if this vaccine 
had came out 12 months ago under a different administration. All these same people that are on TV, you got to get the vaccine, would be saying the exact opposite. That's how I know it's not truthful. It's not authentic. And this is why I keep going. If it's not truthful and authentic, it's an assault on God. It's satanic. It's devilish. When you, they're eliminating the truth. And the only way to restore it is for men to stand up and stand on the word of God. And I know y'all get tired of hearing me say that. I, I know I've, I've been very clear about who I am, who I was, my sinful nature. But this level of dishonesty that we have going on in this country, this level of inauthentic behavior and conversation, it's offensive to me. It should be offensive to you. As a man, as a woman, we're live, they're setting up a fantasy world. Someone, I just saw the, <laughs> what they named somebody, Rachel Levine, a man who claims to be a woman, who Biden named some kind of health, whatever, secretary. She's the first female four star admiral. She just got named this yesterday. And, and or, or this week, and I'm like, are we even living in a real world? Are we serious people? Like, this level of deceit, with, and again, Delano talked about it yesterday, about if they can get you to say, oh yeah, men can get pregnant. They can get you to say and believe anything. I've yet to, I, I want Tony Evans, because I, I want to play a, a clip from Tony Evans, but I, I want to establish off top, he, he's preaching, his sermon is from Genesis chapter 13, I believe, or chapter 3, I'm sorry, uh, verses 8 through 12. I, 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 I just want to establish this as a foundation. We're not going to play a long clip, but I, I just... Want to know? I want to let you know where my head is at and why I've been saying the things that I've been saying and why I'm so passionate about it. And so uh, he read these. I'm going to read it for you here and then we'll play the clip from Tony. Uh, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God and he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered. I heard, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you, this is God, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. <clears throat> and <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Love the fruit, but hate the tree. But, but just more than that, it, it, it's about the nature of Eve and, and, and why men were put in a role of responsibility and leadership. And I know I'm a sexist pig. I'm the worst person on the planet for telling you this as men, that there's a role designed for us that a woman cannot play. And it's a role of leadership and responsibility that was placed on us by a higher power. Even if you don't believe in God, just understand something. As a man, your nature requires leadership from you or the world falls. And the world is falling. And deceit is running wild and rampant because we as men have been cowards. We've abandoned the role given to us. 
And now she's in control and we running in behind her doing whatever we think will make her happy, whatever lie we got to tell to make her happy. And in spaces where men used to be able to talk amongst ourselves and keep it brutally honest. Now there's a feminine energy. Now there's a, a, a supermodel sitting on stage being the overseer and making sure you don't get anywhere near the truth. And I'm sorry for calling it out. I wasn't trying to take some personal shot at Jalen Rose and his, and or his wife. I'm trying to point out what is actually going on in the culture and why America is in the chaos that it's in. We've been displaced as leaders. A feminine energy is running wild in America. Guys got problems with you. Oh, I don't even know his name. I don't even know where he works. All that passive aggressive garbage. That's a feminine energy. I don't want beef, smoke, some kind of war words feud with Jalen Rose. I want men to stand up and be men and don't apologize for it. Play the Tony Evans clip. It's the question of churches and pastors who have to keep calling on ladies to do, do jobs that men ought to do because the men are missing in action. And the question is, Adam, where you at? And so I don't want anybody to hear that, what Tony Evans just said, and think that I'm sitting up here all high and mighty and well, he ain't talking about me. He's talking exactly about me and my failings. I was raised at 25th Street Baptist Church. My grandmother, Mama Lovey, is It's, it's difficult for me to even say her name. And I, I, I made a commitment I wasn't going to. But anyway, <clears throat> he's talking about me and my failures. 25th Street Baptist Church and the seeds that were planted in me there have defined my life and a level of success I've had in America, and a level of being able to climb up out of the ghetto. Me, my mother, and my brother started out 38th and Grand in Indianapolis, show enough in the ghetto. She took a second job, moved us to a little working class suburb, but I ended up back in the ghetto me and my father, one bedroom, 400 square foot apartment in Indianapolis. The reason I climbed up out of all of that and got in a position to where me and my family, my father, the last 15, 20 years of his life, my mother, I've been able to do a lot of things for fam. It's because of the seeds planted in me at 25th Street Baptist Church. And so when I hear Tony Evans talk about where are you, and when I hear Tony Evans say uh, women in churches doing jobs that men should be doing, he's talking about me. I haven't had a church home 
for a long time. I've supported my church that I grew up in, but I've lived in a bunch of other cities. But I have failed. That's one of the reasons why I have fallen in love with Nashville and have been searching for a church home here because of my own failures as a man. I haven't done my job. Churches, God has been calling out to me. Where are you at? That's why I'm here in Tennessee. Because I have to get right with God. I have to be a better man. So do you. I was going to bring uh, Shamika on to have her, and, and I still may. I'm trying to get my head together uh, to make sure that I can. I'm, I'm, doing everything in my power right now to stop these tears from falling out of my eyes, uh, because that would <laughs> probably not look the best considering what I've said about Randy Moss, but you know, I'm, I'm emotional for a different set of reasons. But uh, Jalen Rose, I I'll, I'll end on this note, and do, do we have Shamika teed up or do I need to st stop down? Have we already reached out and called her? Because we are gonna go to... Yeah, well, go ahead and tee up Shamika while I continue to uh, to talk here. But uh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, Jalen Rose. I, I, I just I want to say to you. I don't want any beef with you. I, I don't want to be in conflict with you. I, I do want us as men to come from a more authentic place, be a bit more honest, uh, and, and let's cut out the race game that's being played. We, race is an idol. And again, I, I don't know if Jalen, if you have a, a church home or even a religious foundation of, of any kind, uh, but, but I would ask for you to Seek some out because you'll see a lot of the things that I perceive as inauthentic and the posturing, still Detroit tough guy. I still wear a do rag. I come on camera in a do rag and I front and I pro. Let's, let's do better than that. And, and, not trying to take a, a, some kind of vicious shot at, at Molly, your wife, I, I, I get it. But I do just want to keep it real. ESPN, Fox Sports, all these networks have feminized all these shows and placed these supermodels in the middle of conversations and, and, and made us change the conversation. And now everything's about emotion and it's all about feelings. Oh, I feel like the cops are killing us. Even the stats, the facts, the logic say, that's just not true. Well, I feel like it. That's feminine energy. And we gotta tap into some masculine, male, fact-driven energy and promote that. Uh, so Shamika, I want you to uh, bail me out here so that I can continue to uh, gather myself. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I think I've gathered myself a little bit, but uh, I, I did want a woman's take because I think a lot of people will hear what I say and, and think that, uh, man, what like, he don't like women and you know, he just wants women in the kitchen and blah, blah, and, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we as men have failed in our roles, but what did you hear? Well, first of all, when you said, is Shamika ready? I was thinking, no, don't bring me on after that. You know, you just did such a great job. But if I have anything to give to women and people listening, I was thinking about 
you know, getting in the car and my, my youngest daughter was four years old and I got into the driver's seat and her dad got into the passenger seat and she said, mommy, men are supposed to drive. And I have no idea where she got that from. But if you get it, if you listen just in the physical, you'll miss it. But listening to that spiritually, I heard men are supposed to drive, be in charge, be the head, not the tail. And so I really just applaud what you're doing and reaching out to other men to just take the leadership role and to be responsible and to be active. You know, for years, I would tell my mother Happy Father's Day, because I would say, well, she's the mother and the father. She's, you know, been there. I didn't have a dad. But it, you know, some years ago, I realized, no, I was missing a dad. There were so many things that I didn't learn, even as a young woman, because I did not have a father around. And while I can never take, you know, my mother's role that she played from her, she was a good mom, the sacrifices that she made, I appreciate. I still was without a father, and I missed that. There are things that I feel like may have been different in my life if I didn't have, if I had a father around. So I want men to know how important they are and that there are women like myself that support you, believe in you, and are just waiting for you to actually be the man, be the leader. We need that and we're, we're missing that. And regardless if women don't say it, it, it's still a fact. It's true. You are supposed to lead and be in charge. And without you, we are lost. We are nothing. And we need you, period. Uh, I'm going to let it end there. And uh, I'm going to bring you back tomorrow. And we'll get into that stuff we talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, for coming on and allowing me to gather myself a little bit here. Uh, before we get into Tennessee Harmony and bring the preachers on, and I'll let them correct anything I may have uh, stated factually incorrect. Uh, but go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Uh, also, I'm just a reminder, support my guys at Good Ranchers, please. Goodranchers.com slash fearless. You get 15% off. Uh, be, be a good fearless soldier. You know what? I need you to go right now. Uh, before we bring uh, Bobby and Anthony on, I need you to go down in the comments and enlist in the Fearless Army. Say that, you know, you want to be inducted into the Fearless Army, that you're man enough to stand up and be responsible, or you're woman enough to support these men that will stand up and be responsible. Say you'd like to be inducted into the Fearless Army, either in the comments or in the live chat. I'll be there later uh, today. Uh, reading the comments and all that. So, all right, Tennessee Harmony. Next. Time for some harmony. Welcome back to the show. Uh, I think I've composed myself. Uh, man, that was a fire. Uh, you know what? I'm going to ask you guys to uh, start us out with a little prayer. Uh, uh, Bobby, start us off. Pastor Anthony, finish us off. God, uh, I just want to declare, especially after that last segment, that we know that you're honored by truth and by grace. And uh, thank you that uh, Jason is so uh, committed to truth and, and you, we saw that grace there just at the end. And God, I just pray that that'd be the spirit of what we're talking about. It's your truth, but also your mercy and grace for everybody who turns to you. This is my prayer. Continuing, Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, this platform to uh, extend our ministry and to give you uh, all the glory and honor. As always, as you tell us in your word, your word is truth and to sanctify ourselves by your truth. We pray that all that we say is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Uh, and so yesterday, guys, Delano Squires, who we call the smartest man on the show, 
uh, he wrote a brilliant column. Uh, it was about several things, but one thing in particular, it, it was about we've moved where society determines race, individuals determine uh, gender, and the major point of the piece was that uh, there's an assault on truth. And, and it's like, wow, they can get us to believe or say anything that men can get pregnant. There's no difference between men and women. It's all just a social construct. It's all just a state of mind. And, and it ends up going to what I was talking about previously, in the pre that, that the assault on truth is really an assault on God, and it's the work of the devil. And, and it led me to a point, and Delano made it that in his piece, that uh, the assault on truth is really people using lies to gain political power. And it's a seizing of power. And where, where I end up with that is that we're all playing this power game, political power game, and I see too much of it in the church. The church should be an oasis of truth. And I, I see it being an oasis of politics. And I think that cuts both directions. But I, I, wanted, I think we're going to start by playing a clip from Delano. And then I just want you guys to react to what Delano said yesterday on the show. Play the Delano clip. All of this catering and pandering that American society is doing over feelings is an actual assault on truth. And the assault on truth is an assault on God. Absolutely. And, and if, if I want people to take away anything from the column, it's exactly that point, right? This is not about um, you know, me being conservative or traditional. It's, it's no, the truth is contending, is worth contending for. And we're in a battle for that truth. And for all of eternity, up until basically the last five years, everyone, whatever society, however, you know, whatever skin color, whatever religion they practice, everyone understood that in it, when it came to human beings, we had men and women, males and females, right? It's the most fundamental fact of, of human anatomy and human biology. So whether you draw that truth from Genesis or from genetics, everyone acknowledged that. If we've made an idol out of race, we've made a cult out of gender ideology. And that's where we are right now. So um, to me, again, as a, particularly as a, as a Christian and as a believer, one of the most important things I want people to take away is that this is not just about semantics and about words. This is about truth itself. And if someone can get you to deny that male and female are, are separate categories, that men and women are different, that there actually is a thing, you know, there are men and women. If someone can get you to, to affirm and to parrot the notion that men can get pregnant, they can get you to say anything. Um, and that's why I mentioned in the column that I'm so disappointed in many and many Christians and many pastors and particularly in the evangelical world. Right. The people who are theologically conservative or have theologically conservative thoughts, as, as you would say. And these are folks who oftentimes, again, are just as idolatrous when it comes to race. Everything is about skin color. And that's why they will go back generations in history to tell you about what white conservative evangelicals thought about slavery and Jim Crow and the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. But when it comes to the Equality Act of 2021, they are nowhere to be found. Uh, gentlemen, I want to throw that ball in your court. Yeah, I had mentioned uh, I'd like to comment on it. Um, very interesting statement. Uh, that I'd like to share that ties in with it. First off, Delano, as I texted you, he's the bomb. Uh, and I want you to give him my number. I, I'd love to talk to him. I'd, that clip was a killer. And what made it so good is it's actually better than the blog because of your interaction with him, Jason, because it's really stark. So here's the quote I wanted to share with you and with the audience. 
Communism started in Russia in 1917, and uh, it really controlled Russia up until 1994. And what the Russians did when it was the Soviet Union is if they had dissidents, they would send them off to the gulags in, in Siberia. And the most famous dissident is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And uh, they were able to sneak out some of his literature in the early 70s. He won a Nobel Prize. And when they asked him what the average person could do to not go along with communism, to resist in their situations, the average person, he said it all boils down to one thing, live not by lies. And I felt like that's exactly what Delano was getting at. Because what happens with Marxism, whether it be political Marxism, say in the Soviet Union, which came with it economic Marxism, or cultural Marxism that we're experiencing today, they are forcing you to adopt narratives, the Marxist oppressive narrative, that there's all of these subgroups that have been oppressed, and they force you to adopt the narrative of how bad or uh, how things need to change. And if you don't go along with, like if it's not true, men are not birthing people. Like, uh, and, and biological men don't become four-star admiral women. Like, we're, we're trying to convince ourselves of things that, like you said, we know they're not true. And so Solzhenitsyn's statement, live not by lies. I, I think, I just commend that to everybody. Anthony, what was your reaction? That was the piece that you showed and, and a lot of what he was saying uh, was one that I have recently struggled with is that now I have to, I know how you may feel, you know, a person may feel about themselves and that's, that's okay. But the fact that I now have to participate in how you feel, I, I, that, that causes me to, okay, wait a minute, this is, this is an objective truth. It's, it's not a subjective, this is an objective truth. And so that's a problem, and it's, it's more of a problem now, I guess from my perspective, raising kids. Because on the one hand, you know, you have to teach, as we ought to, teach them to love humanity and also teach them to embrace truth. Uh, but sometimes when I go to the store, uh, my little girl, she, she's kind of like me, she's an extrovert. She'll just ask like, are you a boy? <laughs> are you a girl? <laughs> and we're in the grocery line and I, I'm trying to be not necessarily cultural PC, but I'm just trying to be respectful. Like, well, wait a minute, but she's just a child. You know, she goes to school with boys and girls. And so when she sees someone that seems a little ambiguous, it just sparks curiosity. She doesn't mean disrespect. But what I know is that as we go through life, you know, I talk with some of my members at church who have had instances where they've worked with a person for four or five years. And then now over a, you know, a month or so or a weekend or so, they come back and this person has a new gender. And by company policy, if I don't address you by this, now I'm harassing you. And so it, 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 it's a struggle in, OK, wait, we've got to be able to um, address this in a truthful way, in a respectful way. I still love humanity. I still want people to be good and kind to one another. But I shouldn't have to be forced to live by how you feel about a particular situation that has no basis in truth. Let me throw this at you guys, because this is an issue I struggled with. Uh, mentally, and, and, and for a while, I was probably more on board with the group that I call the Alphabet Mafia than I am now. And, and here was the argument that had me on board initially is that the suicide rate for people with uh, gender dysphoria or gender identity issues or sexuality identity issues mm -hmm. and and it made me th when you hear about their astronomical suicide rate mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then it made me think about me as a kid and, and not that I was a bully, but I just remember we had a kid out that I went to junior high and high school with. His name was Leander Smalls. And black dude, very feminine. Mm -hmm. And he faced a lot of harassment. And uh, he didn't kill himself. He, he died, I think, in his 40s or 50s or whatever. But I did as a person think like, whoa, man, what, his high school experience and particularly in comparison to mine. I was captain of the football team, very popular. Mm -hmm. You know, think of my high school experience as one of the greatest things ever. His experience, mm -hmm. based off my memory of it or whatever, was not good. And so that's where, for a while, I struggled and was like, well, we have to do everything to make those people feel better so their suicide rate goes down. I'm wondering how you guys as ministers Walk me through how you, when someone makes the argument, you can't say these things in the church, it makes people uncomfortable, and don't you know their suicide rates? Mm -hmm. What's the answer? So from my perspective, again, I, I do the best that I can to separate my personal feelings from the authoritative word of God. How I feel about what God says is irrelevant because I honor him and I reverence him as my Lord and savior and creator. The other thing that I would do to deal with someone who has those conflicts, who has those thoughts, who has those struggles, I always go back on identity goes back to the creator. You know, when you are a creator of something, you know, a person creates a piece of abstract art, they know what they put in it. They know how to interpret it. So when someone comes to me with these kinds of struggles and these kinds of issues with identity, we got to go back to God to find out, okay, now how did God make you? And how do we walk through the same God that made you and these conflicts that you have loves you more than you love yourself? And so as I interject in them this relationship with God and I help them to find their identity and purpose by God, that gives a person hope. And that that's one of the leading causes of suicide is a lack of hope. And, I, and we derive our hope from different areas. But if I can go back to give you God loving you in spite of you, God loving you before you. He says, I knew you in the womb before you even knew who you were. So when we understand that, I'm trying to inspire hope in them. And, and, and the whole judgment piece and the whole, well, you can't say this. It's not my saying. Uh, it's God saying this. And I honor and respect what God says. And I live by what God says. And the only way I'm going to get out of this is when I align myself with God's way and his will, not my feelings. So uh, this is a really important question that you've asked, uh, because one of the hallmarks of people who know Jesus is that they're going to be compassionate for all the struggling and hurting. But this is also where we get a chance to put into practice that statement, live not by lies. So one of the things that's true that most people uh, are not living their lives in light of, we tend to live our lives like this world is supposed to be heaven. This is where God's gonna bless us. This is where God's gonna give us everything we want. This is where we get to be sexually fulfilled. This is where if we have desires, we get to fulfill them. And I'm just here to say that's not the picture that the Bible presents. The Bible presents the view that this world is broken, that our ancestors, Adam and Eve, uh, lost the way, and they lost the way, and they shook their fists at God, and they said, we're going to do it our way. And God said, okay, you can do it your way, but you're going to live life in a world that's broken. The world is going to be broken because you're going to have sin in your heart that uh, you wanted to follow the leadership of Satan. So you're going to have a battle. You and your descendants, God said to Eve, you and your descendants are going to struggle with demonic forces all your life. You're going to struggle with sin and brokenness in your own heart. And guess what? The world that you're going to live in is fallen and it's broken. And that brokenness affects every part of life for some people. Some people are born blind. I'm an asthmatic. Uh, some people are born with disordered desires. Uh, some people have, and we could spend 
uh, literally um, millions of days listing all the potential disorders that are part of the corrupted world. Our world is broken, and sometimes, and this is where compassion is so necessary, sometimes that brokenness manifests itself within us, and the corruption caused by the fall means some of us are living uh, in male bodies, but we have a desire to be a woman. And what do you do with that? Well, number one is you begin with compassion, but you're grounded, like Solzhenitsyn said, in truth. And the truth is, God made us, we were made for him, and he calls us to live out his truth, even when it is difficult. And so we wrap our arms around one another. We say, this is really difficult. We're going to be here for you. You're not alone. But we are going to honor God's truth. And his truth is that we are not to be... Uh, biological men convincing ourselves that we are women or convincing ourselves that it's okay to. So another thing, and I don't want to keep talking because this, this is a, a, an important topic, and that is that we are raising a generation that is too afraid of having our feelings hurt. There is not enough teaching on you know, we've got to be tough-minded. We've got to be tough. This is the way it is. And uh, we can make it with God helping us. We can make it. We can live certain ways. We can deal with adversity. We can deal with challenge because God is truth. And when you're living a life of truth, you're going to deal with hardships. But you have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and a church family that helps you to say, it's worth it because one day Jesus is coming back and that heaven and earth that we desire here and now, that real heaven, the new heaven and new earth, that's where we're going. And all this stuff will be gone when we're there. I think you both gave really important answers. I may be a bit of a dummy for asking this follow-up, <laughs> but I, I just want for everyone to understand it. And, 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 and so, I can hear the people on the other side saying, well, we have to do some things in this world we live in now to make it more palatable or better for those people with gender dysphoria, sexuality issues. This, this previous culture was too hostile towards them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They faced violence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and harassment. Mm -hmm. and, and so where do you guys stand on how, because there, I would have to think there has been some improvement and people have adjusted. And so where kids. Yeah, let, let's, let me just talk about that yeah. because that's exactly right. The, the truth of the matter is that we've got to start with repentance historically for how the church has treated many people with these struggles. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, not too long ago, a couple years ago, I was going to spend time with uh, somebody really close to me and there'd been a, there'd been a conflict because uh, this person uh, was um, homosexual. So there's a man named Wesley Hill who's a Christian theologian, wrote a book called Washed and Waiting fantastic book, and he really helps uh, believers who have no struggles with homosexual desires to, to understand the world of a homosexual person. And it was really good and really helpful, and I reached out to him and I talked to him and I said, so Wesley, uh, we're gonna have this conversation. Uh, there's some, some real hurt feelings here, and I, I, wanna, I wanna speak truth, but I wanna do it with grace and love. And he said, Bobby, you know, the first thing I would do is I would apologize for how the church has treated homosexual people throughout the generations. Because it sure is hard to speak any truth when you look at the track record of how so many people have been treated. Yeah, that, he, he's hit the nail on the head. The other thing is, you know, you pointed out, yes, we've improved. The problem is as the pendulum swings, 
society culture is going so far on the other side to where now we're just eradicating truth altogether. Yep. That's not where we need to go. We need to go again back to the word of God uh, and all of those tenants. If we adhere to them, they will address all of it. So that love, that compassion, that repentance that goes to the previous culture, that goes to the current culture and the culture to come. If, if we stick to those and not necessarily looking at it from a social scenario, but an adherence to God's will and his purpose, that's what's going to get us back to where we really need to be. Not necessarily looking at, well, how do we do this? Well, then let's just say, hey, you do whatever you want to do. No, no, no. It's not going that far. Let's go back to what God says, and that will address it uh, accurately. Anthony, I know that when we first played the Delano clip, mm -hmm. there was something you wanted to push back on, but he, mm -hmm. he, he says that the church is quiet mm -hmm. on the Equality Act and everyone's standing down. Mm -hmm. You wanted to push back a little bit on? Well, yeah, he, he was speaking, uh, as I understood it, as there are those uh, particularly churches, black churches, I'm, I'm assuming, that will reach back into the annals of history to say, oh, well, this happened to black folk, this, that, and the other. But then as it is presently addressing equality, uh, LGBTQ issues and all transgender issues, they're quiet on those issues. And I'm saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm like Bobby, I want to reach out to Delano to say, I got 20, 30 guys in my phone right now that are just as passionate about those issues as they were about issues that we needed repentance of in the past. All right, so one of the things that sparked this conversation we're having today was I saw something over social media uh, where attorney Benjamin Crump had tweeted out an Episcopal church that had a sign. Do we, do we have that tweet? Uh, I, yeah, had, had a sign. Do we have, yeah, the picture of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, and it's some of the, the faces of God or, is with the church. And so what I see that as the church is reaching out to try to bring people into the church and they're used, I don't know if they're putting God's best foot forward <laughs> is what I think you're being very kind right now. Is what, is what got me, and I'm like, what's going on with the church? The church is so caught up in the culture that's outside the church that we're, these things are very popular over social media, and, and, and they're a part of a political movement and, and the, this racial idolatry that we have that, again, it's about seizing political power to me more than it is looking for justice. And so I, 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 that's what I was like, whoa, the, this is the foot we're putting. We, we have all these better feet we could put forward, but we're putting forward, you know, and, and you know, but for the grace of God, I guess I could be George Floyd. Uh, but, but I just don't know if, th that would almost be like, let's put a picture of Jason from 2012 inside a strip club and say, faces of God. <laughs> Here's Jason at the strip club. <laughs> you, you, we got nothing better to reach out to the people with? Then I, anyway, I, I just. So um, the difficulty with this tweet, and I, I appreciate you getting it, because a lot of people don't realize the difference in churches. And uh, I know uh, when I was first being introduced to what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus, I didn't know all the difference in churches. But what you've got is you've got a, a segment of dying churches, and, and the Episcopal Church is one of them, uh, and they have sold out to the culture a long time ago. They say the same thing that the culture does, and they're under the uh, illusion that by saying to the culture what the culture wants to hear, they're somehow going to help the cult people in the culture come to Jesus. But the Jesus they offer is not really the Jesus of the Bible. It's a compromised Jesus. It's a, it's a progressive liberal Jesus who actually doesn't represent the Jesus of the Gospels at all. And we're using these people who are not godly people and trying to, you know, make them heroes and draw people in based on them. It just shows to me a sickening, corrupted uh, uh, sellout 
that the values of the world, and, and really, again, we've talked about the basis of those values, that those are not coming from a biblical view of what uh, would draw people to Jesus. Bobby, I want to push back. Not that I disagree with you, but you use the word not godly people. And I think there are some people that would say we're all godly people and we have all fall short. And my failures are no different than George Floyd's failures yeah. or Ahmaud Arbery's failures. And so I tend to agree with your sentiment, no, but and, I'm wondering, and, and is I, that the right I, choice? I appreciate of the opportunity to clarify because uh, we are all uh, men and uh, women who fall short. And um, we are not, you know, none of us want to portray ourselves as, as better than we are. And one of the things I really appreciate is about the radical honesty of this show, of our weaknesses and shortcomings. But a person who's pursuing Jesus and is pursuing his ways and seeking to live the kind of life that Jesus did. Uh, at least I know, I've, I've looked enough at George Floyd that that was not the case. And uh, you know, the honesty about that uh, is what I'm trying to speak of. And you know, we, we, we as church leaders want to hold up people who are pursuing living for Jesus. Not that they've arrived, because nobody has arrived but the pursuit and the center of our lives are around following Jesus. I agree with the core of that. I agree that um, you know, we don't wanna put up people that aren't pursuing Jesus, uh, but as I sent in the message, you know, my background has always been, I don't want any image of God to be worshiped. God did not want any image of him to be worshiped because what what comes with images uh, I'm an artist what, what comes with images are interpretation what comes with images are a lot of psychology and all the, that are around it as of where we are right now the image of George Floyd is political it is polarizing it is you know all kinds of signs and so when we put that kind of image up and we say next to it, here's the face of God, those who are reading the image are going to get a picture of what God is. If I want to put an image up of Jesus, I got to tell you about his life. Uh, Paul actually does this uh, in the book of Colossians. Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So I couldn't give up a face to say, okay, this is what God looks like. Because to every face, I think we were just hitting on it, to every face I may put up. If we put your face up, who put my face up? Somebody's going to be able to say, well, hey, I know he's blah, blah, and he's supposed to be. But if I say, hey, Jesus is what we're going after. And that's where for me, you know, even within, you know, our ministry, I understand as a black person uh, what George Floyd meant for a lot of black people. I understand that there are some people that look at him and they see, man, here's another black person that was killed by a white cop. I know that instantly when they see his face, there are some people that are gonna run to, hey, this is racism. It, it, it doesn't matter what anybody says, racism. And there, uh, there's another side of folk that may look at him and say, well, look at his track record. I mean, it was gonna happen one way or the other. And what I wanna do is step above that and to say, hold on guys, wait a minute, here's a tragic death, okay? So when I look at what happens with me, while somebody may argue either side politically, I'm trying to get to not the political lens, but I'm trying to get to what the issue is. And the problem with that image that you showed, and, and going back to what Bobby's saying, the church is trying to draw. Now, they, I, I wanna give them benefit of the doubt. Let's say they're, they're trying to get across the message we are being compassionate to how a segment of the population may feel about that. They may be trying to do that. The issue that I would have with that is I don't want you to attach to George Floyd. I want you to attach to Jesus. I tell my own congregants, I don't want you to attach to me. I want you to attach to Jesus. Paul, when he goes in to preach at Corinth, he says, 
I determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. I didn't want to come with eloquent speech. I didn't want you to be impressed by my presentation. I want you to be impressed by the power of God. And that's it. Hey, Jason, one of the things that I assumed that we should probably articulate is that um, the real backstory is that George Floyd was not living any kind of godly life at all. And that's where I was coming from. Got you. I, I want to, and I'll get back to that, but I want to uh, go push back a little bit on a couple things that Anthony said, or clarify, I wouldn't mm -hmm. even say push back. But you, you said what George Floyd meant, mm -hmm. and so that's, and I think it's actually what George Floyd means, okay. because sure. he meant nothing before the last, to, to the great mass of black sure, people sure, after sure. his death. And then the other thing, you use the word compassionate. Mm -hmm. And I think, <clears throat> and, and I don't want to step on y'all's toes, and, but I, I'm, I'm y'all the experts or whatever, but the most compassionate thing you can do for a human being. And to me, if I was a church and wanted to use George Floyd to attract people to my church, what I would actually do, and any of these guys, Breonna Taylor, if you want to use them, I would have, but we'll reduce this one to George Floyd. I would put up a picture of George Floyd, and I'd put it up next to Derek Chauvin, and I would say, both of these men needed Jesus. Ooh. Amen. Oh my God, if we could have gotten George Floyd and Derek Chauvin inside this building and heard this message mm -hmm. and let God go to work on them, mm -hmm. Now we have a chance because they both desperately mm -hmm. needed. I can't think of a better articulation yeah. of that's Christian compassion. message. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so, and again, the most compassionate thing we can do is, and again, I know I haven't done it in the best way possible, but it's just like why I keep sharing my testimony and my life or whatever, because I'm trying to show compassion. I'm mm -hmm. trying to. Uh, let people know here's the things that have helped me and made me successful because as it relates to any of these guys and on either side the mm -hmm. police or any of them but if Jesus were involved if 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 they were pursuing Jesus these events wouldn't have happened and so Bobby I, I agree with you in terms of you know George Floyd was into porn he was into violent crime, certainly had a drug problem. All of that mm -hmm. would be helped yeah. uh, with a relationship with God mm -hmm. and a church home and people working with him desperately. Derek Chauvin showed a lack of compassion for nine minutes. Yeah. If he were right with Jesus, he probably would have stopped after one or two. Uh, but so that's where I guess I was just what we're not sending out the right message. And I'm sitting here as a layman or as someone, a, a baby Christian. <laughs> I'm not a very mature Christian. I'm a baby Christian despite my age. And I'm like, I got it figured out better than this church. And they got somebody has been trained th theologically and, you know, mm -hmm. seminary school and blah, blah, blah. He's a leader. Looked like it was a nice church, a nice world, <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, they don't know what food they should be offering up. Yeah. So, absolutely. Here's one of the problems today is that some churches care more about politics than they do about Jesus. And it happens on the left and it happens on the right. You have churches on the left who are just wanting to trump what, whatever the uh, left is saying and they champion that and they push that and they, they cloak a Jesus around their politics to the left. And to the right, you have people who cloak their politics around what they're saying. I, I, I sat down uh, with a guy um, who uh, w was coming back to church and uh, I knew he was real political to the right. And I was trying to press him that don't come to church if you want the church to be about your right wing politics. And I said to him, I said, let me ask you a question. At the end of the day, when, you, when everything boils down, which is more important, the U.S. Constitution, because he's a real constitutionalist, I said, which is more important, the U.S. Constitution or Jesus? And he paused. Mm. 
And then he said, I guess it's been the U.S. Constitution. Oh, my. Which was a very honest moment. But I, I just want to say that Jesus doesn't come riding a donkey or an elephant. <laughs> Jesus wants to, uh, us to turn to him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And through the eyes of Jesus, we look at politics to the right. Through the eyes of Jesus, we look at politics to the left. And we say, hey, he's King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Biden isn't. Trump isn't. This is the guy we follow. This is the guy who can make our lives the best possible lives, living our lives based on truth with love, mercy, and grace. Anthony, I, I want to follow up on, because I forgot the one other little point I wanted to make about George Floyd as it relates to mint and means. Mm -hmm. I, 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 as believers, I think it's a mistake for us to place meaning on George Floyd to us in terms of, and, and I don't say this callously, okay. and, and I want to be crystal clear in terms of my cousin, Anton Butler, died at the hands of police in Indianapolis in 2012 at 26 years old. Mercy. I helped raise him. Mercy. And uh, so the the whole George Floyd, I see a lot of people that, oh, George Floyd means everything. And I'm like, come on now. No. I, I, this is like, it's a show. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's not real. And it's like, my cousin did mean something to me. And I think about him every day. I look at his picture every day. But, but I'm looking at people glom on to George Floyd and pretend like he has all this meaning to them. And he, rep he references all these other things and reminds me of Emmett Till and makes me think that when mm -hmm. I go out, I may get killed by the police. And, and I'm just, as a Christian, mm -hmm. and just a baby one, but there's like, there's certain things that I do as a Christian that give me perhaps a false sense of security that I'm not going to get killed by the police. And the re most the reason is because just as a Christian, when I roll that window down or when they pull me over, when they stop me, I'm going to hit them with some Christian energy. Mm -hmm. And it's no different than what my grandmother told me when I was a kid. And I think I shared that with y'all. I, I thought I, I know I talked about it on the show, but I used to have bad nightmares. And my grandmother, mm -hmm. my mother told me, like, uh, just say, uh, devil, get away from me in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's just like, you put that Jesus into the air. And, <laughs> it, 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 and so I don't, when I think of George Floyd, and even when I think of my cousin, Anton Butler, who I loved, and I'm telling you, I helped sure. raise, but he got involved in some activities that put him in harm's way. Okay. And, and in this specific instance, mm -hmm. we don't believe as a family that he was doing anything that put him in harm's way, but he was on parole. He had been, the police had caught him with drugs and guns mm -hmm. and things before. And so I just, instead of us looking at George Floyd and saying, oh God, that could be me. Uh, I kind of look and say, man, thank God I'm a Christian. And there's some behaviors that I do that tend to keep me out of that kind of trouble. And, and, and again, this is where Steve, uh, not Steve, uh, Bobby's talking about live not by lies. Uh, w let's don't lie to ourselves, those of us that are Christian, mm -hmm. that somehow the police are going to, are, you know, on some violent manhunt looking for us, mm -hmm. and that every time we engage with the police, it's a near life or death experience. Let's not live that lie, because that's not real. I, I was a very bad speeder for 30 years and got pulled over all the time. And I was a big black dude, I wear an earring, I dress kind of crazy, drove a Mercedes. Nothing violence ever happened to me with the police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I, I just, we've placed an importance on George Floyd that I think is inappropriate. So you just mentioned it in the show, how the, or we referenced how the pendulum swings. OK. And so you talked about how we responded to kids in school harshly a culture ago. Yes. 
And now the pendulum has swung to where, okay, now, and now everybody that wants to come out is given a platform. Everybody that's, you know, I'm this, or I'm fluid, or I'm whatever. You now are a celebrity because you have announced to the world your sexual orientation. Not your accomplishments in life or not overcoming struggle. I'm just letting you know, you know, this is my orientation. So in, in likewise, for a lot of us black people, um, the nation we've dealt with injustices in our history. I mean, it's it's evident. It's America's sin. It's evident. So there's a segment that says, OK, wait a minute. We've been unheard. We've you know, been overlooked. We've been underappreciated, et cetera. And here's an example. So George Floyd is almost a an evidence of a psychological issue, a PTSD of suffering. We have went through this, we went through this, and now here's another situation. And so he gets elevated. And, and what happens, and this is again why I go back to the images that we choose to exalt. If I exalt Jesus, guess what we can't say about Jesus? Jesus had no flaw. Now he's still, his presence is still dividing amongst the world. He even announced, he says, I'm coming with a sword and it's going to cut through families, father, son, mother, daughter, just Jesus being Jesus. And even those who stand with Jesus, that's going to come by itself. But we would never be able to question his character. We would never be able to say, well, yeah, he was actually this or that because he was perfect and sinless. When we exalt a any citizen, any celebrity, any person, when we exalt them, now we're measuring the gospel of Christ based on their flaw or their character. And it often loses the issue at hand. When I look at a George Floyd and you brought up a lot of it, when I look at that situation, yes, I am sad that another citizen dies, period. That's a soul that we all must love. You mentioned it. God, in his infinite wisdom, gave George Floyd breath for all those years. Even while he was in sin, he loved him enough. He loved Derek Chauvin enough. He even loved me enough to give me a couple of more breaths than George Floyd. I'm still here. So if God can love him and love me, okay, here's a citizen that's dead. Now to the issue. All those behaviors and all those sins that we listed about George Floyd, that's enough preaching right there for a whole congregation. We got to get better on this. We've got to get better on this economy, education, poverty, uh, 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 all these soul issues. We got to get this right with God, period. And, and that's enough to talk about. I don't have to assassinate him for his sin because I got him and you got him. But I do need to address those. So for me, you know how I dealt with it in our congregation and I took some heat, but I looked at the issues. I didn't look at the person. I don't even know if I mentioned his name in my sermons, but there are some people in the Bible that suffered some stuff. Uh, you mentioned this about, you know, being in the right place, the right time, doing the right things. Take a look at the life of Joseph. Joseph was just gifted by God. And he faced trouble in life, not of his own doing, but because of what happened in his life. You don't necessarily have to trouble trouble for trouble to trouble you. So sometimes things do happen, but let's not look at who we need to exalt. I don't want to exalt. And that's why the image to me, I do understand the politicization of it. I do understand the polarizing nature, uh, nature of it. I do get, you know, like I said, I can see where they may be trying to go, et cetera. When I first saw that, I'm like, I don't want to lift anybody up. George Floyd, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. I don't want it because I serve King Jesus. That's that's. And, and, and as it looks, you know, Bobby was mentioning about politics as it relates to politics. My mission to make disciples of all nations has not changed under Biden, under Trump, under Obama, under Clinton. My mission is the same. So after we we pray, then we vote, we vote, then we pray. And then after that, we got to get back to work. So inner city kids, young uh, 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 black men, in, in my case, I, I have an emphasis of that because I am a black man, but young black men and what I know of our issues, 
I got to tackle that regardless of who's in office, regardless of what policy gets passed. And even if those do get passed that I'm not for and I see are against God, I still have to have a direct connection uh, with the community and changing people's lives by the word of God, not by my politics and not by my ideology, but by God's word. I would say this, and we'll, we'll end, I'll let both of you respond to this and we'll end on this. The, uh, and I get why ministers tackle issues related to pain and suffering and uh, it's a compelling story, you wanna capture people's minds and, but, but the gospel is the good news. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's like, when part of when I see the focus on George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or whatever uh, it is like, can we? It would it not be more effective to tell the unbelievable things that faith in God has? And I'll reduce this, at the, but it really applies to the entire country because that is my message. Is like. We had a Judeo-Christian culture mm -hmm. and, and, and Jesus and our belief in God allowed this country to do incredible things and overcome incredible sins and just flaws. And then I look at us as black and we're, there's so many great things that our faith has allowed us to accomplish as black people. Mm -hmm. And should we not lean more into that good news and tell people about here's what can be accomplished if you walk with this man? Certainly. If you go out there on your own, and, and, and again, this applies to the entire country because George, Fentanyl or George Floyd has a fentanyl problem, but the entire country has a drug problem. Mm -hmm. We think a drug is a solution for everything. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just for, oh my God, Whitlock, you're overweight. Well, take this glucophage to control your insulin. Don't exercise, don't lose weight, don't change what you're eating, blah, blah, blah. We just want a pill for everything. Mm, mm. And, and so I look at George Floyd no different than, and again, it's part of what I saw. Oh my God, there's COVID. Everybody better take this vaccine. And no one, don't, don't fast that the Bible says, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't fast and pray. Don't get your, your, your body right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Take this vaccine. And, and it's like, we can, we, there's almost no conversation about that. And that's the good umbrella to wrap this under in because I was talking about the vaccine and all this other stuff, but no one talks about, hey man, let's get in better health. Let's make sure we're fasting and praying. Because your mind actually controls everything. And if you spend time with God, meditate in deep conversations with you, it will improve all kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. It, so anyway. No, no, I, the, uh, <laughs> it, so I just want to say again, the great thing about what you're trying to do with Tem Tennessee Harmony is take us back to the Judeo-Christian roots on which the country was built, which people are abandoning for this cultural Marxism that we've talked about, this wokeness. And to go back begins with going back for the individual. So let me just talk about me. I'm, bro I'm a broken person and I need a savior. There's a brokenness within me. I struggle with my weight. I struggle with uh, lust. I struggle with inordinate desires. But Jesus came to save me and he gives me a way to live my life by truth his truth because he's the creator and his truth for my life, which he wants me to trust his grace and mercy and forgiveness and then learn to walk with him. I, I believe if I hadn't become a follower of Jesus, uh, I would have become an alcoholic like my father was. I would not have been able to st stay married to one woman for all these years. I wouldn't have been a great father because when you're divorced from the kid's mother, it's hard, I don't care who you are, it's hard to be a great father. But I've been, I've been a good father, I've been a good son, I've been a good brother, I've been a good friend to, uh, to people around me. And why? Because Jesus has taught me to build my life around his truth, which is grounded in the way things God wants them to be, 
even as I fall short, until the day I die, I'll still, in my brokenness, in a broken world, need to depend on his mercy and grace. And that is the story that I'm building on, that you're building on, that you're building on, and we're calling everybody in the nation back to the gospel story that we're broken people and we need the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God to help us live out his truth in this world to make it a better place and a better country. When we make better people, they make better families, they make better churches, better communities, better states, better nations. And that's the call of the gospel. I like what Bobby just mentioned. Um, our testimony is a part of what the message that we share. So what God has done for him, what God has done for me, likewise, I wouldn't be. And that's not to say I'm up or down. I just wouldn't be here if it weren't for the power of God. Uh, and so with his power, you know, being born, my dad died when I was two years old. God was my father. Uh, God enabled my grandmother to take care of seven people in her house and she's the only one working enabled her to have that faith to pass down to my mom, to pass to me. Uh, God enabled that. And so my response to a lot of life situations is not from an elitist perspective or from a perfect perspective. It's from the perspective that the only real solution that I know to help us overcome any of it is God. It's the only one that has worked. Uh, when we look at what you talked about, when we look at those who tried drugs, look at that path. You don't see a lot of people come out of that to say, hey, had I not been on cocaine all this time and it, today it, it makes me better. No, they're trying to get out of that because it doesn't work. None of that stuff works. But Jesus, he works and his track record is unshakable. All right. That's it. And that's all from us today. Uh, man, that was a good show. Good long show. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope you did. That's tomorrow play, and we will see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my sister, no relation. We all just wanna have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone. I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back. We are receiving, all receiving. We all wanna be free. We want freedom. I just want, I wanna be, I just want.